Well, hello again. This is Brian Copeland talking. Welcome to another edition of Copeland's Corner. I'm here in my family room where I will be joined by, well, not that's a joy, virtually joined by a group of distinguished comics. We've got a great show today, and uh, we'll talk about some of the news of the week, and we'll just riff like we do every week. Um, just one thing this week I wanted to mention again, and that is that we are trying to get, you know, we're doing the show on uh, on uh, uh, YouTube as well as doing the, the audio version that we've been doing for, this is episode 161, I think, and it's the, the sixth episode that we've done on YouTube. So in order for us to do this live on YouTube, which is what I want to do, um, I need to have a thousand subscribers. So... Um, we're getting there slowly, but surely we're getting there. But once we have a thousand subscribers, we can do this live, which means you can be a part of the show, which is great. You can send in texts, you can send in emails, you can ask questions, you can take issue with things that we say, you can chime in, you can ask questions. It'll be an absolute blast, but I can need a thousand of you. So we've got several thousand of you who listen. And what I'm going to ask you to do, if you're somebody who's listened to, haven't checked out YouTube yet, is go to YouTube, search Copeland's Corner, find us, and then subscribe. It costs you absolutely nothing to subscribe. Yeah, it just makes it easier for you to see the show if you decide that you do, in fact, want to see us instead of just listening to us. And after seeing some of the mugs that you see on this show, maybe you don't want to see us. I can understand that. So, uh, but regardless, it'll help us out. And uh, and I like the idea of doing a live show. I did live radio uh, here in the Bay Area for years, and uh, I miss the live interaction, you know, with the audience. So uh, so do that. And with that, on with the show. This is part of the podcast that we call Headliners on the Headlines. we got a great show today. Uh, returning to the show, two of my pals, two of my favorites, Johnny Steele with the dog up in the corner. How you doing, Johnny? What's All happening? Right, thank you. And you got a trick you're going to show us in a minute. Yeah. Uh, Carlos Alas Rocky is back in an actual yeah. studio. Yeah, I was so calling you from another studio. place last time. As opposed to me with yeah, no mic, and I'm just sitting here in front of my MacBook in, 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 my, in my family room. And uh, joining us for the first time, our virgin today, is uh, is Paco Romain. Good to see you, Paco. Hi, good to see you, too. Hey, now you made the finals of the San Francisco Comedy Competition, correct? I want to I be like Carlos. I'm going to, uh, although it's not plugged in to anything. Um, yeah, yes, exactly. I now, did. When, 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 when are the finals? Uh, they were this last weekend. Oh, they're over. So how, yeah. how did you place? I placed third. You placed okay. third. Well, yeah. Congratulations on making the finals. Johnny won it. And Carlos, uh, how did you do? Have you? Did I, I you won it, it as well, but you know, history seems to have been kind to second and third place for sure. Robin Williams, to name name a few. Oh, Mark nice. Curry, you know, That's right? Mark Curry came in second, ha hanging with Mr. Cooper. I think. I think. Too bad for so, uh, Paco, though. Most of the third place finishers have passed away. So yeah. I don't <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. Seriously, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's the fourth place winners. They're the ones that kill the third place. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you What do you get for third place? If you don't mind me saying, you can say none of my business if you want to. But you get well, to be I, on I the Brian. It used to be ten grand if you won the whole thing back yeah. in the day. So I don't know what what is it now. Uh, if you win the whole thing, I think it's seventy two hundred now. Oh wow! Just, Which is wow. Yeah, it has not been moved with inflation. Uh, third place, would I? You get the do the Brian Copeland podcast. <laughs> um, so. Lucky you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, I made some cash. I think I made like two grand or something like that. Yeah. I'm curious how, how the hardest part for me of that, because it was, I don't, again, I, it's been years since I did it. And I came in, I came in 13th and I was behind Greg Proops by like two one hundredths of a point or something. <laughs> uh -huh. So Greg and I just missed the, we, the, 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 the semis. And and for me, um, the, the hardest the hardest set to do was the five minutes. I've never been good at five minutes. Mm -hmm. Ten minutes is my sweet spot. I can do a ten minute set fine. I can do a twenty minute set fine. But yeah. five minutes is just hard, and you got to grab mm -hmm. them. And they've seen fifteen other comics before you. I, are, are you guys? I see you nodding your head. You guys with me on that? Yeah, I always found that more difficult to to manufacture that kind of personality that quickly. I just, I always marvel at the guys that could do it. Remember Bob Ullman, 
would come out. And I think it was Barwood. He would come out, take his time, pour a cup of coffee, and then go. When you go to work, do you start right away? Uh, he had that classic <laughs> opener, right? Uh, right. Margaret Smith, uh, how you guys doing tonight? Not too good? No, how you guys doing tonight? Good? Uh, I guess that's what sets us apart. You know, <laughs> boom, that one yeah. line that just gets that person the character I never I, had. I did really well in the five-minute portions. Yeah. I think I won like eight or seven out of the 15 wow. going in. But the longer ones, there's some of the people just were not feeling me. The audiences were just like, no, yeah. not this guy. So, Interesting. Yeah. You gotta keep in mind, these kids are soft today. They got 15 acts, and I think in the in the preliminary rounds, we had 20. Remember that? You'd have mm -hmm. an MC. That's right. 20. My and day. maybe a guest set at the end. So you were sandwiched, you know, on a bill with 22 comics and yeah. it ran yeah. three hours. And you drew the last slot at an 8:30 show or eight o'clock show. You're going on at eleven. And it yeah. really you really had to think. I think the comics who did well, and I learned this because I did poorly the first time, got in it two years later, took like sixth or seventh, didn't make the finals, and then went back and won it two years later. I learned that where you are in the lineup precedes you. Oh, Those yeah. things are if there's somebody in front of you who's doing a similar act and I'm sort of manic and unscripted, then that blows your sort of surprise, right? Yeah. And, and, you yeah. know, if the guy in front of you really kills, you can have two possibilities. You don't do as well and you're, and you're through, or you use that energy that they had and just run right on and mention something from their act and you co coattail it. So it's more about seeing what's happening and knowing what room you're in. One night's conservative, one night's yep. liberal, one night's True. a big giant room, one night's intimate. It's really about adjusting. Yeah. Each yep. I think more than anything. Absolutely. And, and going on late, you know, I mean, you know, you're hoping that there's a premise that's left. Yeah. You know, I'm like 18th or 19th. I remember the time that I did it uh, in, in the in the prelims, the first night was at the punchline in San Francisco. And out of the 20, I drew 19. Ooh. I drew 19 out of the 20 and just, just you know, ate, ate my weenie. Yeah. I mean, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was just, I came in, I, well, I was nervous too. That was a thing too, because you're nervous. You got five minutes and you're being judged and yep. all this stuff. And I think out of that 20, I think I came in 19th or 20th. So uh, I got advice from a comic now. You got you guys older guys though, Doug Ferrari, who had won. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and what Doug said he did to overcome nervousness was he did a hypnosis. So he hooked me up with his hypnotist. This, oh, what? this is the second night. So I go and I do hypnosis. And and the, the prompt they gave me was if I feel nervous to flick the inside of my wrist. And I did it. And I came in first. What? what? I did it. And that night, so I went from 19th to 20th to first overnight with that trip because any of the butterflies, any of the, and I, I didn't draw 19 again. You know, I mean, I was earlier in the show. I wasn't first. I was like, actually, right in the middle is kind of the sweet spot because they're it warmed is. up by then. That you know, they're warmed up. There's still some premises that are left. Yeah. You know, oh, that's it's, great. It's that the, reminds me of that famous Leave It to Beaver episode where he gets uh, advice from the fireman because he's afraid of the roller coaster, and he tells him the story about Gus and the net. Gus was afraid to fall in the net, and then he did it. Just think about Gus and the net. So Beaver's on the top of the thing, and he's like, Gus and the net. Gus and the net does the roller coaster. That was his little flick, Gus and the Net. Do you guys remember you? remember a comic? I hope he's still with us. Named uh, Michael Boats Johnson from our oh, day. Yeah. Oh my God, that Giants fan. Years. Yeah, he had a he was really silly, which made me laugh a lot. He he had a joke about. It. Did you hear about the maritime accident? Uh, a blue ship ran into a red ship. Everyone's maroon. Oh no. <laughs> uh, oh no. Oh no. You have to look at the visual. Remember this one? A shop teacher goes, a wood shop teacher goes to a bar and orders four drinks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he I told me it. one night he said, um, I, you know, I'm a blue collar, you know, outside defensive end guy. I don't know anything about all this nonsense about hypnotism and breathing. But he was like, breathe in through your nose, hold it, exhale. And while you exhale, imagine that stress is like water on your arms and you've just gotten out of the shower and the pool and wipe it off as you exhale, wipe it off your body, wipe it off your legs. Do that about five times right before you go on. And amazingly, it really sort of, if it works, because you close up and you don't breathe when you're nervous. Yeah, and, right. no. it, and so it helps you to breathe. So you get an oxygen and it helps you to think about something else other than your fear or your concern or your apprehension. And it, I never forget it. It really, really helped. 
And of yeah. course, I went there like a maniac. But you know. yeah. <laughs> before we jump, we, we jump into it this week. You you did a trick. You did a dog trick for us before we came on air. So I, oh, yeah, I did. If you can get the dog to do it again, and that's the whole thing. Dogs and kids, they never do yeah. what you want them to do when, yeah. it, when it counts. So he's pretty good though, because when I went to adopt him, they go, "Well, he might need some dental, and that'll be about three grand, and it costs five hundred grand." Yeah, well, he need, might have to have a tooth pulled and some other stuff. So. I thought, well, so I called my accountant. I said, any way I could deduct this dog? He said, every time you're on a, get him to do a trick or two. And every time you're on a podcast or have a gig, bring him on stage, have everybody uh, take pictures and probably write off half of everything he has. So there you go. He's <laughs> gentle. So here we are. Here's Nikki. And he's a nice little yeah. rescue that I fostered when he had a bad back back in November. He's a very nice dog, but he has one trick. You ready? Hey, uh, Nikki, rather than going on a hike this afternoon up in Tilden Park, what to say we sit here at home and watch a bunch of Brian Copeland's old stand-up comedy videos. What do you think? <laughs> okay. Wow. I guess that means no. <laughs> uh, I guess he'd rather go. go hiking, bro. I love your stand-up, but he wants to go hiking. I don't know. Hi, Mr. IRS. <laughs> Ka-ching. Write that off. All right, on the, on the topic of comedy, uh, Tiffany Haddish is um, was served outside of a comedy event. She's walking into a comedy event to MC some uh, benefit thing, and she gets served with a one million dollar lawsuit for defamation because some bit she did about some former friends went viral. And there's interesting that the bit that she did was not it wasn't true. So my question is the. It, do you ever have you ever gotten any grief for anything you ever said on stage about somebody that wasn't true? Have, have you said things about people that weren't true, or have you ever worried about it? Now I'll tell you on stage I've said stuff, but nothing defamatory. In my in my my solo shows and my one man plays, which are, are are comedy mixed with drama, you know, every single one of my plays has something in it about my stepfather, and none of it is is complimentary and i've always said if he wants to sue me you know he was an abusive prick he wants to sue me he wants all that out in court sue me you yeah know, i'm saying it's not true sue me you know so but uh, but other than that i've never worried about it have, have any of you guys you know very early on especially at the holy city zoo when i I was always a mimic right so just i mimic what i see in banking at the united savings on fourth and clement right by the uh right by the Holy City Zoo, that was my bank. It was all Chinese. And so I would just relate my experiences to how they treated me. Mr. Carlo, Mr. Ala, we call you Carlo. And doing a silly joke, like I love that bank because I was always the tallest one in the bank. And just all the communication problems we had. And if I did the Asian voice, people were saying, you're being stereotypical. Racist. I'm like, no, I'm not saying they're bad drivers. I'm not saying that they're this or that, or they, they have squinty eyes. I'm just telling you my experience at the bank. There's a communication gap. And so I would get grief for that. Off stage, of course, I got grief for voicing the Taco Bell Chihuahua. You know, I was canceled before cancel culture was was. You got right? I remember that. Oh well, yeah, not no. The, the campaign didn't end because of that, but people would call me and say, "You're a racist. You're a sellout. How could you do the voice of that dog?" Yada yada. Oh, would you tell people who don't know that you were the voice of the Taco Bell? Yeah, Chihuahua? I was. You, you gotta Taco do Bell. it. You got. Well, you have to do it. Yeah, Taco. that's my one dog trick, right? I don't. I love Brian Copeland. Screw that other dog. Um, so, no, and luckily, uh, luckily, luckily, we have a caller here who wants to weigh in. Who is a chihuahua? What do you think of that impression? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Too bad, bitch. I'm rich. <laughs> but no, so so that kind of comedy on stage, I got flack for, and also off stage, you know, talking about and or being the Taco Bell dog, I I got some flack for. But so uh, what? What? Is, what? Like emails, letters? What they wrote? Le to phone Taco calls, Bell? emails, letters. Yeah. Uh, what was his, uh, oh God, Casares, something like Casares was his last name, the League of United Latino Citizens or whatever. He called me and you're a sellout, you know, this is a crime against humanity. You know, like, <laughs> it was pre 9-11. Somebody needed to escape Chihuahua, something, uh, I went to Sacramento State, the, 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 uh, organization of Latino students, students holding up a poster, po post Columbine holding up a poster of the dog with two X's in its eyes with bullets going into its and oh she had you know, killed wow. the chihuahua. And they, they were there at Sac State to protest me. So Did you ever meet the dog? Yes, Gidget. I met her, met her on the Sony lot during the uh, uh, Vivo Gorditas shoot. I went to meet her. Oh. Is she still alive? Because the no, dog was no, forever. No, no, no. Oh, this those was 1998. Well, okay. Well, those dogs can live 18, 19 years. <laughs> chihuahuas. Yes. They're like cockroaches. 
Yeah. You know, Johnny Dog will live hey. for 40 years to do that one trick. Just as <laughs> doesn't eat, doesn't walk. Yeah. Still do the trick. I was, as you know, I was a radio show host for a couple odd years in San Francisco. And um, I wanted to add sketches. So I brought two brilliant guys in, uh, Michael Meehan and Michael Robert Meehan, Hawkins, yeah. who later was on that Titus show on Fox or one of those networks. Yeah, Titus. He was Don't a writer. Chief and- Dan George. Yeah. Chief and, Carl. Yeah. Oh, well, that Chief Car- Carlos came on and uh, we so we did sketches and had friends. And Carlos did a Native Generation X Native American guy who hung outside a Manny's donut shop on La Cienega. Hey, talk like this in Playing slot cars. Uh, <laughs> maple bad. bars are half off or something like that. Yeah. We got complaints galore for that. And so one day we do a sketch and Michael Meehan and Robert Hawkins came up with it. It was uh, the Native American warrior Magua. And he has a call-in show. People call him with problems. And of course, every response is that you basically scalp and kill them. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so we had this music. And, you know, we do all these voices. And, you know, I think I did one. Magua, I got an artichoke. Uh, I got a garden in the yard. It grows real good. Everything grows good. But the artichokes won't grow. What should I do? And then the Native American drums, boom, 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 boom. Oh, Magua say, bring Magua to the garden. Magua will rip the artichoke apart and eat the heart in front of the others. They will see this and fear you. Oh, thank you very much. So every single thing was Ma- That is <laughs> and, so laughing. I love it. Oh, my God. We got. I think uh, Lucas ILM or whatever it was called uh, had a letter with 40 people signed on it. And I, then I think we did a sketch about the scene where a bunch of people living in a country are using their, you know, their natural defensive art skills and whatnot. And then Indiana Jones just pulls out a gun and shoots them. And we said, oh yeah, that's not condescending. And so they, they stopped complaining after that, but yeah, it's everywhere. It's everywhere now. Carlos is right. It's been going on forever, but it's, and you know, and comedy's exaggeration, you know, I mean, it is. That's exactly it. You know, so, we, we blow things out of proportion. That's what makes it funny. I know we'll be a, a stand up for, um, uh, what's the comic's name? Uh, Indi- uh, Indian comic who's getting a lot of grief. Because- Hassan Minaj. Yeah, Hassan Min- uh, Minaj. And she on The View, you know, uh, gave an impassioned defense of him saying, look, this is comics. We exaggerate. That's mm-hmm. what it is that we do. It's not a documentary that you're watching no. for yeah. you to drink minimum. No. Yeah. You know? and, if you're, and if you're observing traits, which if, if one particular race or one particular gender tends to do something more than others. And that's a verifiable fact. I don't see how I'm a monster by acknowledging that that's true, you know? So uh, it's, just can't say of... it's a verifiable fact. I guess that's the reason why, because sure. what you're going by is anecdotal or folklore or whatever. If you're talking about something like, let, let, let's take Chinese drivers. I mean, yeah. you know, when I started in comedy, that was the joke. Everybody had a Chinese driver joke. Well, all Chinese people don't drive like, you know, sure. our, our poor drivers. And so that that's not a verifiable fact, but there are those sure. who would argue with you that it is. But it's but the term there, whether or not all do, and everyone agrees, are there people ethnically or age wise or something else that drive better than other groups? And the answer is probably yes. Can you verify? So here's a joke uh, I wrote for Robin Williams, and of course this was before uh, yeah, I wrote some stuff for Robin back in the day, and and he was a cyclist, so he was doing all those uh, uh, Lance Armstrong things before that all caved in. And yeah. so one of the jokes I wrote is, I love the melting pot. It's a great place. Uh, the only place it doesn't work is on the roadway because I'm a cyclist and every driver on my street is either an 80 year old Chinese guy going 20 or a 20 year old black guy going 80. And so <laughs> all the cyclists spit up when they heard that. Why would they spit up when they heard that? Why? And so, and then Robin loved it and he tried to twist it. Maybe a guy tells me and I tell him he just wouldn't touch it, but he loved mm-hmm. it. Remember when I told him he was drinking out of his bottle of water and he just spit it up, but you know, I don't know. Yeah, here's the thought I, I had recently because I walk dogs and I'm like, I don't care what pronouns people use, but if I'm walking my dog, I need to know if your dog's a male or a boy or a girl because my dog is like, they's not going to cut it. I, I can't no. hear a they. Is it a boy yeah. or a girl? So, yeah. I got in trouble. Uh, people always complain, right? One way or another. But I do a bit now about how when we played football in the old days, you tackled the helmet, helmet. Now it's all ruined. All the woke got in it and everything's different. And you can't go and ta- First of all, you can't tackle them helmet to helmet. First of all, before you even do that, as you approach the ball carrier, you first have to ask them their pr- preferred pronouns. And then, yeah. you know, and, and, then, and then you have to ask them like droopy dog, may I tackle you? And then you grab them in some kind of rugby role and spin them around. And you're someone's like, well, that's offensive. It's belittling of the pronoun issue. Oh my God. It's just, yeah. it's a simple example. Obviously you're not, 
not asking a ball carrier his pronoun before you're, it's just a ridiculous. It's, it's an exaggeration. Let me ask, let me an exaggeration you. about, you know, we have to be careful about the way we tackle because we're trying to be more protective. What would right. come? It's a simple rule of comedy for the kids at home. What then? What next? If that, then what else would follow? How far are we yeah, going to Paco, go? Let me, let, me, to let me bring Paco in for a second. Cause yeah. So talk about, have you got, have you got in trouble for anything that you've done and, or have you pissed somebody off by something that you've said in in a bit using somebody? You know, a lot of people, uh, there are a lot of people who got in trouble with their moms and their dads and so forth for bits that they've done, have gotten some kind of grief. Yeah, no, I haven't. I mean, for one, my parents aren't supportive, so they don't listen to my comedy. Oh. So it's fine. Um, but no, I have, I did, I did change, like, like Carlos, I used to talk about my brutally honest gay Asian hairstylist. That was like my best friend. And I'd get my hair cut and he would just say like, your face is so fat. And I would do his, his voice. And I stopped doing that bit. Cause I was like, this is going to lead to me, people getting upset. I used to have a joke about one of my ex-girlfriends cause she was just kind of dumb, you know? And I changed it to a, a buddy of mine. So I just shifted it to a male uh, point of view and it works. You know? Let's bring on Bobby Probably. Slayton. <laughs> you always women are the number one reason for men going gay. What were you last night? You sit up suck a cock right now. Oh, go, go, go. <laughs> Black people are big. Bobby, Bobby's putting together a because he retired. And, yes. and he's putting together a set. Yeah, I was I was reading on Facebook. Uh, he's on my feed. He's putting together an hour set to go on stage somewhere by popular demand. But he he's saying I don't know if there's any, anything I can say. Because not, the not, not, not in the classic Bobby way. And it's too bad. Oh. It's a shame because it is. We're it's you know, we're having a laugh, as they say. We're 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 poking fun. So I think I think we were better when everybody made jokes about everybody and nobody cared and everybody knew they were exaggerating. I think that's part of the problem. It's I hate to yeah. beat this cliche, but uh, I think it's a sort of participation trophy people and people that haven't been told no. Hey, we live in a pluralistic society. People do stuff every day that offends and threatens me. It's not just words. I've been yeah. an environmentalist, vegan, vegetarian for 40 years. I go to my friend's house and they're, oh, we must do something about this. We must be do doing something. Oh, here come the lamb chops, chop, chop. You know, it's like, you know, you're, you're participating in a horrific cruelty that's unsustainable, poisoning our land, destroying our water. And I'm supposed to sit there and be perfectly fine. But if I do a dead on impression of Frank, my Vietnamese auto mechanic, John, you're not going to like Frank. When Frank tell you how much Subaru cost to repair this time, Frank yeah. is laughing. All of his employees are laughing. But yeah. the, the white woman who's 42 years old, uh, and who went to some private school with two names and studied you know, interpretation of the Zimbabwe dance, she's upset. So we all have to, you know, 90% of the people who aren't offended have to bend to her. It's really a crazy way to run things. I'm not. I, I got bent for this gig. I, I did a lot of of of, uh, of opening for people like Aretha Franklin and I've toured with Smokey Robinson and people like this. And I was doing a show with Earth, Wind and Fire at a, a, a big concert venue in the South Bay and just destroyed, just absolutely destroyed the thing you know just one of those sets where it's like you know is this like an uh is this like an audience filled with my moms you uh -huh. know? it, was, it was like one of those sets and i called the following week to say you, you got anybody else coming in i can open up for they said no we can't have you back we got one complaint wow wow somebody yeah. complained about a joke and they couldn't even tell me what the joke was and i worked yeah. clean because when you're open up for people you got to work clean you know so i still to this day have no idea but i this I, this is probably 10 12 years ago i have not been back oh but wow I, I was out about it back because of one joke because one person out of i think that place held like 2500 maybe and it was sold out for earth one and fire yeah wow. and and, uh, and so because one person complained uh, I, I can't come back. So we we had the same thing, Brian, when we used to do the year-end kiss-off with Will Durst, and it happened at the Freight and Salvage in Berkeley, and two people, we, that night I think we sold 300 and some tickets, and two people complained, and we learned, later learned they were docents. They weren't even people who paid to oh, see the show. There were docents who volunteered to help people find their seats and whatnot. Just and they were offended. And so they sent us, they have a policy to send a letter. So they sent a letter to Durst, Will, and it was two jokes. Debbie did an impression of a Filipino woman. And so Will had to write back, Debbie is half Filipino and she's doing her aunt. Uh, like and Rob in the Snyder. bit, yeah. and, 
in the bit, the ant is victorious. Is it's you know she's and then Johnny did a, a bit about an Asian woman, and Will said Johnny's bit is based on him really sucking at yoga, and the woman twenty years next to him happened to be an Asian woman with whom I converse at the time. I converse with a lot, and in the end, I'm really crappy at yoga, and she's really good at it. And then you know, the bit is end up. I mean, I got a blood vessel bursting out of my eye, and I got sweat pouring off, and she's balancing on one finger eating a Sudoku puzzle, do, uh, doing a Sudoku puzzle, eating a pork bun. And, and, you know, and Will wrote back and said, you know, Mari is a single half Latina mother. Uh, there's four people in the group that are senior citizens. Johnny's real name is um, Lopez. And by the way, he's a vegan animal welfare, blah, blah, blah guy. And she just went up, down yeah. the list. Uh, and we gave you a two and a half hour show and out of 350 people, two people complained about two jokes. We can't. And they said, can you promise that you'll come back and not offend? And Will, to his credit, said something to the effect of, no, I can't. I can't. Thank you. will not return. If that's your standard, yeah, no, yeah. we can't do a well, comedy. I'll tell you, that's why, why, why Seinfeld will not, will not play colleges. You see that? He was on yeah, with yeah. Uh, Colbert. And he talked about he was at a college and he did a joke. And it had something to do with, um, with scrolling through your cell phone about how you're deciding who's worth calling. Or who's worth uh, who's worth, worth returning? And he's scrolling. You know when you scroll through your cell phone, you scroll like this. And he goes, you know, you're scrolling through like a like a gay French king, was the line. Yeah. And they <laughs> booed him almost off the stage. Wow. For that well, I, line, and because of that, he will not go back. I, to I kind of feel like the pendulum swinging though, kind of back towards like a little bit. Let, let all the chips fall where they may, kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've been doing a lot more comedy shows, not just in the Bay Area, but out and around. And I feel like more and more audiences are kind of like craving like less political constraints and, you know, thematical constraints and things like that. I just get this. I totally agree, uh, Paco. And I think the, the thing to remember here, one thing to remember is this uh, to use another tired cliche. This is sort of like an iceberg, you know, um, most people in the room just don't want to speak out because they don't want to get involved, but they are sort of on your side, but you know, it's the one performative perpetually agree person who's going to bark out or write a letter. And then there's trouble. And often it's keep in mind, it was two people at the freight and salvage out of 300 and some people. So it's just another thing for people to know that recognize too. If any of us got on stage and did a half hour screed against Asians or whatever, that might be as concerning. Yes. If you go on stage, and I do. My very first joke is about my Spanish ancestors. They were indentured servants. They were in Hawaii for a year because they couldn't pay for their passage. So they went from Spain to Hawaii and they picked fruit and vegetables for a year to pay their passage. And one day they looked around and they saw, you know, beautiful year round temperate climate and fruit falling out of the trees and half naked, beautiful brown women bobbing in the surf. And they said, hey, screw this. Let's move to Antioch. And so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. then I make fun of the Italian side. I make fun of my dad. My dad is in our high school hall of fame. He was a great dad. I love him, miss him every day. I make fun of him being cheap. He was more than that, but that's just one thing I choose because I've only yeah. got a little bit of time, you know? And so keep in mind, if, if you're making fun of yourself, and I think we all do a little bit, yeah. you're making fun of your own family. You're, And then in there somewhere, there's it's a different, It's a, context is really important. And if you're Vietnamese, your mechanic, who you like, and who I've given literally tens of thousands of dollars to in 25 years, and invites me out for drinks. If I do an impression of him and he laughs and everybody, and that's a, this much of my act, and that's all you can see, something is wrong with you, not us. Uh, I wanted to stretch, stretch the parameters here, Mike, because I saw Ricky Gervais who said, imagine going through your life where you have the privilege of not being assaulted. And he's saying, I, I, want, I believe that we should be able to say anything we want, although he avoids the N-word. George Carlin used to use it. I saw... Uh, uh, what's his name? Redhead comedian Louis C.K. do it at Harvard. Is there any context now where you can say that word if you're not black as a white no. comedian? No. So, no. so, no. so that I, that I will tell you unequivocally no. And I will tell you something too. My my son. So, so right. Carlin couldn't come back if he were alive today no. and do what he used to do. No. It's just not possible. It's Even not though the context in which he used it wasn't offensive. It's just the word per se. The, the, the two words that you cannot say on a stage and get away with are the N word and the C word. How you, about the K word for, for Jewish people? Even though, because, because now, I, you know, I, just think that I think that that would depend on the context because I've heard comics do it. So what we're really? saying now, though, is we're complaining about not being able to say whatever we want for risk of offending somebody. But now yeah. we are laying down rules. So yeah. the other cultures must be going, well, what about me? Absolutely. You know, so 
Either it's, you can uh, or you every... can, but it, to me, it's always going to be about context. It's so funny. I did a bit, which is now on PragerU, which is so ridiculous. I told Adam about this, uh, your son. Uh, uh, D. Allen Moss was, he was fucking with me. I was in an all black comedy club. And before he brought me up, he started talking about slavery and say, we are still wearing chains, my brothers. And now a very funny comedian. And like, <laughs> and I come up there and I, I go, this is either going to hit or miss. I go, hey, Brian is talking about slavery. I don't know what to say. I'm like, hey, it's not so bad. You know, we killed the Indians. And it sat there for a second and then it was great. It killed. And I said that as a joke. And now literally, if you watch TikTok and you see the Dennis Prager University, they have that bad Columbus character going, you know, slavery is not too bad. You know, you could be killed, but now you get to work. And I'm like, oh, my God, my ridiculous joke that I did 30, 40 years ago is now actually on Prager U as fact. But <laughs> well, I did want to visit that because with, there with are that. certain words as brave as Ricky Gervais is or pretends mm -hmm. to be. He yes. won't go there. Because he knows. So, well, maybe, sense, but maybe that's his own personal preference of a, of a boundary and not a constraint sure. that he feels people are putting on him. Like, sure. I think, that, I, I think, I do think they're two that's different true. things, you know. Well, just to take the other on the I, I wrote a bit do it on the C word years ago. Yeah. That I, and, and, I, and the reason I wrote it was I wanted to see if I could get away with saying it. Is it mm -hmm. Caucasian? Is that, that was the really, well, yeah, that's it, Caucasian. <laughs> and, and I wanted to see if I could get away. With with saying it, if I if I did it in the right context, if I set it up as it's a vile word, it's an offensive word, it's a word that that really is upsetting the women, and and but it's just a word, and and the joke was what I love is is guys who will throw that word out in anger and then have the nerve to try to take it back, like say Ooh. no, I didn't call you that. I said you were acting like a, oh, man. you know, I didn't call you that. I said you were acting like one, and it would work. I actually got away with yeah. it. I actually got away with it. Now, when I try that now, when I try that joke today, not on your life. I still do the bit where I was with Riley in the car when she was two and a half years old and I was late to a birthday party and a guy cut me off and he was rude and he wouldn't let me go. And so I said, of all the years of training as a stand-up comedian, all I could do is roll down my window, punch his car and say, F you, you effing C word. And Riley's like, what means C word? And I say it because it's what I really said in a moment of anger and how it portrayed to my kid in the back who asked immediately what that word meant. And it kind of works because it shows like almost in Johnny's sense that I was the fallible one. I'm the one that used an improper word in front of my kid and, and just did the wrong thing. And I don't know if I would be afraid to do it now. I, I used to do it as, as recently as a couple of years ago, but um, if you use yeah, that I, word, you're automatically a misogynist. If you use that word, you not if you're gay. Not ready. if you're gay. Not in the gay community because they toss it around. My friend Charlie Adler. That's the first thing he says when you mess up in a on a take. You stupid. Yeah, let's see where you. And the you know, English. Don't the English throw it around like that? Yeah. Yeah. Blanky bollocks. You know. Um, so I think context. Everything is if it, as long as it's not meant to deride or hurt or diminish or stereotype. Right. Johnny should be able to do a voice that he hears and replicate it. Uh, that's my, I make my living doing voices, right? It, it shouldn't be, and you had said this, you you did this bit just to see, see if you could say the word and it worked. I really felt that about uh, Chappelle's uh, trans bit. I went, I, when I see the bit, his punchline is it's not blood, it's not blood, it's beet juice. I'm like, wow, you went a long way for a really not very good <laughs> joke. It's not a good joke. No. So I know you wanted to do it just to prove that you could say that you could say it, not because you thought this was a great bit, because he has yeah. far better bits than that. Yeah. But should he be derided and protested against for it? No, I don't think the bit was funny enough to protest. Yeah. That should be the protest. Where's a better joke? <laughs> yeah, because he's a brilliant comic. But that bit, you could tell, he's like, you know what? I'm going to tell this story and I'm going to say this punchline because I'm I'm going to push the envelope here. Yeah. And I, I felt it fell short in terms of quality. So Colin Quinn, Colin Quinn used to do a bit. You remember this? Uh, it was in one of those little TV things he did, like a little special he did on a particular topic. I forget which topic. And he said, so I'm walking down the street. It's a guy complained because I'm walking down the street to the guy the other day. And this like Mexican guy comes up to him. And the person says, why, why does it have to be a Mexican guy? Can it be? A, why can't it just be a guy? 
I said, and he said, yeah, okay, I'll change it for you. So the Mexican guy who is really Mexican in my real life story about being a Mexican guy uh, was not a Mexican. You know, so he's just yeah. talking about the ridiculousness of there's some importance to the guy's race, um, which is ironic because certain factions of our society, that's all they think. I talked to my friends. I said, so uh, so Martin Luther King is an idiot then because it's it's now only about the color of your skin. So they're concerned about race. But when some when Colin Quinn mentions, you know, that the guy in his bit is a Mexican guy, which is pertinent to the story, um, he's bad for recognizing the guy's a Mexican. So it's a complicated. And I noticed this, uh, uh, Brian, I don't know if Paco was there uh, last Sunday, comedy day in the park a week ago. I was. Yeah. The, the annual people who don't know comedy day started 40 some years ago by a really swell guy named Jose Simone. And he thought comics should have a co company picnic and give back to the society. So it's it, it, at its peak, it had like 25,000 people in the more, audience. More than that. It was more than that. that. first comedy day, there were 60,000. Really? And, wow. and now it's down to like a couple thousand on a good day. But um, uh, and I just noticed this because I watch a little of every set. Uh, it's plenty okay, apparently, to make fun of white people, old people, yeah. uh, people, anybody from every everybody. And to, I get arguments with my friends because uh, I might go to Florida to go see the Keys. I would never go there. They're Republican. I, it's I, I think half of the state is not Republican, and you know, twenty percent don't even vote. And so there are things you can make fun of, genders and races and ages that you can make fun of among the same exact group that bristles if you dare do, you know, a voice of your auto mechanic um, who happens to be- They're a not big... protected groups. I'll tell yeah. you, going, going back to the Colin Quinn story, um, as, as you guys all know, I my, my first solo play is a play called Not a Genuine Black Man. And what it's about is, you know, people say that I'm too white and I'm not a real black man. And mm -hmm. the backstory is me growing up in, in San Leandro, California, when it was like 99% white and my African-American family and all the things and trials and tribulations and racism and stopped by cops and all the mm -hmm. stuff I've been. So one of the first pitches that we had to Hollywood for this thing, to try to do this as a special, the executive said to me, and I'm not kidding, this is not a joke. Well, okay, we like the story, but does he have to be black? Uh <laughs> Does he have the entire show is about racism? No, and yeah, racism from African American people, racism from white people, but the, the, that's the entire show. That's the theme of the of the show. Yeah. And I'm asked, does he have to be black? Wow, holy crap! That that's is always the case, right? Wasn't there a movie you guys probably remember this a movie many years ago? And a guy's pitching a story, trying to sell a story, and it's a bunch of middle aged people in a cabin somewhere. And then he keeps, and then he keeps Hollywood keeps turning it into a bunch it's of people half that age at a shack on the beach in bikinis. It's, you know? it's, it's the oh, big that picture. Was the Kevin Bacon movie. It's the yeah. big picture with Kevin Bacon directed by Christopher Guest. I knew you'd know. That's All right. right. Yeah. And, and, and his, the character name is Nick Chapman, and he's pitching it to J.T. Walsh. Yeah. It's a love triangle between women. He's like, what about two women? There's something about two women. And the assistant <laughs> goes, it's true. Uh, I got to tell both Christopher Guest and Jamie Lee Curtis that that was my favorite Christopher Guest movie of all time. Really? Scripted, wonderful, but that is the precise thing. Yeah, there's. it starts out being a love triangle between two men and a woman, and it ends up being a sexy stewardess bikini ghost parade. <laughs> Yeah. And so can I just what it circles back around and ends up being what the original the original vision was. at the end it does but yes at the end it does but it, it's and just a complete and total aside uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Christopher Guest uh, I'm 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 working with Rob Reiner on finally getting that a genuine black man made oh nice and his other project that he's working on is he's working with Christopher Guest right now on Spinal Tap two nice. Wow. Lovely. Yeah, they're they're going to do a part. They're going to do, a, and I'm and I'm I'm trying to figure out a nice, kind way to beg him to put me in it. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll be, I'll be a roadie. Just I hope this the care. subtitle is this one goes to two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, we should we should do a little bit of news since I, I sure I think we're going to do uh, news. Let me ask you this question. Um. I had dinner with a prosecutor buddy of mine last night, the San Francisco prosecutor, and we were talking about this. If, you know, out of all of, of, of the cases that Trump has been charged with, um, the two that are really the most dangerous for him are, are Georgia, Georgia, the Georgia case and the D.C. case, you know, in, inciting the insurrection and 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 uh, uh, collusion to overturn the 2020 election. There's a damn good chance that he's going to be convicted. 
He goes to prison in March. He goes to prison. He goes to trial in March. The judge is a hard ass. Uh, judge uh, Tanya uh, Chutkin has been the toughest judge on people convicted in her court on January 6th. She's thrown the book at it. She, mm -hmm. The prosecutor will come in and go, we think this person should get nine months. She goes, nah, a year. I mean, that's the kind of judge that she is. Mm -hmm. So if Trump is is convicted in her court in March, she goes to trial, he's convicted. Um, do you think that she, anybody else, you know, based upon her history, would be immediately remanded and sent to jail. Now, there is there are judges who will say, okay, you can stay out pending appeal. And appeals can take years. So do you think that in this particular case, is he treated like anybody else? And does the judge remand him to court, to, to the Department of Corrections? Or does the judge say, uh, okay, you, you can stay out on your own recognizance uh, pending appeal? Yes. Hmm. I think B. I don't think there's any way that that he would be go, go to go to jail or whatever. I think there'd be like some restrictions on his travel and movement, but I don't think they'll ever take really? him in. Yeah. I think I, the reason they they put people in jail during that time is they're a threat to others or they're a flight risk. Those are the two main reasons. So if it's determined he's not he's a threat to the world, so maybe that's a yeah. problem. <laughs> You know, so if he's not going to, if he's not a flight risk and he's not going to, in theory, physically harm is what often you're doing with people who committed a certain kind of violent felonies. So I don't know. I don't. You know, as long as it precludes him from running again, I would be satisfied with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to ask you this question because there are, there are, are um, suits that have been filed in 14 states. I think it's the 13th Amendment. And, for, and forgive me if I'm wrong on this. It's, it, it was uh, an amendment that was added during. Uh, reconstruction after the Civil War, that if you take place in an insurrection uh, or rebellion against the U.S. government, you are barred for life from ever holding federal office again. And so you have uh, so you have suits that are filed in 14 states saying that he should not be on the ballot because he took part in an insurrection against the government. So uh, do you think that he should be barred? Well, let me ask you two questions. One is, do you think he should be barred from being able to run again? And number two, his defense is he did not. He was not responsible for that insurrection. He didn't tell people to trash the Capitol. He just said, march to the Capitol. He never right. told them there. He sent out. He sent out a, 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 a tweets the day before and the day before that, saying, "Come on down. It's going to be wild. Come on down." But he never actually said, "I want you to go down there and trash the Capitol and break in and sit in Nancy Pelosi's chair." Yeah, he didn't say those exact words, and that's it's certainly a way to escape. But um, yeah, it's very tenuous. It's hard to prove, right? Uh, that he exactly said those words. He said, "You're not going to go quietly. You're going to have to fight." Uh, he did want to stop the process. I think he said words in, in, in the effect of stopping the election from going through. Mm -hmm. I think he said we're going to have to stop this from happening. So maybe that's that's where the catch is. But uh, yeah, he never said those. He didn't. He didn't. And he did not end up going with them because no, he, they had he, to, he wanted to. Yeah, yeah. They restrained him. They restrained him. He wanted to mm -hmm. march down there. Now yeah. that was lucky for he him. He wanted but, to. He was going to march down it, but then he heard there were like 50 steps to get up. And so yeah. he <laughs> could you so, imagine that story? That's the most egregious. I mean, there's so many egregious Trump stories, but the one where he was was in uh, uh, in in Europe and it was some commemoration of those who had died in World War Two and mm -hmm. he wouldn't go because it was raining and it was going to mess up his hair. Yeah. So so he wouldn't go. And then he called them suckers. He said, what was in this for them? The ones that died, <laughs> that they were suckers. Well, well they said, well, what about what McCain? He said, I, I like I like soldiers who don't become POD. But <laughs> <laughs> who captured. I like, he, he, he's not we're a hero because he got captured. Yeah. I mean, uh, even, on, even on the left, you know, he's, you know, McCain was revered, at least for his, yeah. you know, his service and his what valor, he yeah. endured and his love of America. And here's... That's why I don't understand that this guy. I mean, I sort of understand, but he's just a charlatan. Now, politics aside, he, you know, and you know this, Brian. He had no politics. Everyone, yeah. he's a racist. He went to he went to seventy five boxing matches with Don King for God's sake. Yeah. You know, he, he also put he also put you know, put out that full page ad 
Central Park Five. Central I think Park he pedals five. in racism. I think he uses ah. it as a dog whistle to inflame people. There you are. And then, yeah. and then, while the left is running Earth-erism. around, yeah, then he's appointing, you know, federal judges to benches that are right of Mussolini. And the left is running around <laughs> screaming about, something, you know, that he used the wrong noun. I mean, I think yeah. he. <laughs> I think he has no skills on earth. As I said before, people, yep. he's a brilliant businessman. No, he's not. No, he's not. This, he's this not. is what he is. He fell out of a golden vagina into a bassinet full of Krugerrands. Yeah. <laughs> not you not know, a line of the day, by the way. Thank yeah. you. He's Congratulations. You, so, you won the internet today. <laughs> so he had no politics. He hung around with Bill Clinton. He's, mm. you know. He is this. He is really, really good at this. Demagogues, dictators, um, totalitarian leaders. Everything's really simple. Find out who your enemy is. Rile up your side, them in a way that disables them. Rile up your side in a side that they're willing to do anything and run into the fray like Japanese soldiers in the South Pacific in, in you know, 1944. Or, and Tora, that's Tora, Tora. I know you know it. I know you know it. I know yeah. you want to do it. Let's Tora, Tora, Tora. <laughs> yeah, because he famously Yijima, said, I believe Yijima, that he, beautiful island, beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he so here's said the, that if he were going to run for politics, he would run as a Republican because they're easier yeah. to to dupe dupe. Yeah. So here's a question, Brian. Let me play host for a minute to everybody. Okay. Here's, I think, a big fear. So what happens if he is um, convicted and he goes to jail? What do you think happens in America? What the people who thought he lost really won the election? I mean, and let's be frank: how many were there that day in a country of three hundred? What do we have? Thirty million people, mm -hmm. uh, a thousand mm -hmm. of idiots. A but thousand. what do you think happens? People are like, "Oh, we're gonna have a civil war, or there'll be riots in the streets." I don't know. Have these people learned their lesson? All these guys, all those people went to David jail. Crash. Lone yeah. wolves. The the big fear that they have is lone wolves. Is Timothy McVeigh kind of lone wolves? Yeah, yeah. We're going to do things like break into Nancy Pelosi's house and beat up her husband, and who are yeah. going to do things like blow up, you know, the Oklahoma City building. That's what it is they're looking for. They don't think there's going to ever be an organized protest no. like there was on January sixth. No. That's not what they're what, what it is that they are uh, that 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 they're afraid they're of. Fearful but of, but yeah. he becomes more of a martyr. The the thing is, once you put him in prison, what well, it'll take two seconds for him to be labeled as a political prisoner. That Joe Biden jailed uh, sure. a political opponent. That's how they're going to spin this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even though it was all of his uh, appointees, his judges, most of his judges, yeah. are, at least at the lower level, and uh, his FBI. And, yeah, He's doing yeah. all the yeah. investigations, and his former. Freaking attorney general Barr just going, yeah, he knew, man. He yeah. knew he lost. So, yeah. And, and then you look at Cheney and Kinziger and Mitt Romney. It's not just Democrats, but yeah, he is a demagogue. He plays upon people's fears. I don't think he's a racist. I just, he, he blows the racist dog whistle. They're not sending the best people. They're sending the rapists. I yeah. know because I'm a good rapist and I know one when I see one. <laughs> They're sending the Mexicans that are going to grab the pussy. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, it's totally true. I agree. Yeah. Totally. Why, are, why is that getting so little play, by the way? You know, the um, uh, the Gene... Um, Gene Carroll, yeah. The Gene Carroll case. The judge factually said, came out and said, when he was trying to appeal the $5 million judgment against him by saying that he was convicted of a sexual assault, but not of rape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was not... And the judge actually came out and made a statement. No, you are a rapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the judge came out and said, you are a rapist. So, you know, what I don't understand is why, why is this getting no play? Why is this lost? Why is there so much other stuff going on? The, the fact that you, you got, got a guy who was the once the president who made you the president again, and it's a real possibility with the Electoral College, he may be the president again, has factually been named a rapist. I, I think it's lost because they got the Supreme Court they wanted and they don't have to pretend to care anymore. There was a time where they had to have some sort of decorum, like, oh, we're a little bit offended, but like, nope, got our Supreme Court. We don't care what he does. We don't care what he did. That's our guy because it's power. I think so, also, with Trump, I think with Trump, too, I think there's an element of people being like, of course he is. And it doesn't have that outrage that is implied to somebody that you'd be surprised about. You know, mm -hmm. if we found out Biden was a serial killer, we'd be like, what the fuck? That doesn't seem like Joe Biden. But when someone you expect to be a serial fucking rapist or someone who you feel is always going to defraud cancer patients or have uh, businesses that they've exploited, it's like kind of like, yeah, of course. You know? Of course. 
He also Sorry. does a thing in debate called a gish gallop. You ever, I think it was a yes, professor. gish gallop. Yep. Yeah. And so the idea was um, I wrote a joke for Robin about, we worked on a joke about it that he did on Letterman, which was uh, about the gish gallop. I, I, let me explain it first. The idea is you're in a debate and you've got two minutes and the other person has two minutes. In your two minutes, you say the most insane, incredible, outlandish, nonsensical crap. And then you say so much of it that people can't even remember like how many crazy things you said. And then you turn it over to your opponent and he's only got two options or she has only two options. She has to re spend her time responding to that nonsense or she has to ignore it and present her platform. So I think that's kind of happened with Trump. I mean, how many people were indicted or went to jail or were in that Oval Office with him and then got thrown out uh, for one sort of fraud or one sort of whatever? It's just so much. And after a while, people, I mean, it raises the level. It's like a guy who goes to war and sees a corpse and he throws up. And the next, you know, three months later, he's walking through bodies of dead people eating a sandwich. I mean, you become uh, sort of yeah. acclimated to yeah, that level. Yeah. Right, well, let, me let me ask you this. Um, the the Georgia trials are Gotta going be to be televised. Have to gavel be televised. To gavel, it's going to be like the OJ show. Gavel to gavel are going to be televised. Um, but unfortunately, Trump isn't the first one. You're going to have some of these lower level defendants who are going to be first. Uh, the the one that, I, that I'd like to see televised and that most people want to see televised is the D.C. trial. I mean, that's nice. It's by nice, I mean, it's clean. There are not 19 defendants. It's clear there aren't a billion charges, uh, a, a billion indictments. It's pretty simple. Either he did this or he didn't. All mm -hmm. of the of the, of the, the people who are, who are, uh, are testifying are Republicans. Uh, they were Republicans who he either hired or he appointed or were cronies of his. This is flipping. not anything he can pin on the Democrats or anything else. If this were televised, do you think this would change the minds of some of the people who were in this cult? It might. It might change the minds of the people that were on the cult fray, the cult adjacent, right? Some of the independents, because it's not about what he said on the day. I think that trial will reveal all the planning that went into it and, and mm. the detailed planning and of what they wanted to do, which was to disrupt a peaceful transfer of power and to stop the the electors, all the fake electors, all that stuff. And so that's what would probably get him more than what he said on that day. Yeah, but I think it, it, it would dissuade the independents a little bit. A little bit. I think so. I mean, like one percent, maybe. I think the rest of enough. the Trumpers in the world just. I mean, it's. I went and rented a car in Michigan, and while I was waiting for my car, the woman said to me. She's like, you live in San Francisco. She looked at my idea. I said, yeah. And she's like, so like we can you can just we can at least agree that Biden's a reptile. Right. Like that was her <laughs> default. That was her like homeostasis beginning of like, of course, we can agree that Biden's a reptile and that there's a secret continent in the United States where they keep giants that are coming back to help out to get rid of the pedophiles beyond Maybe. that we may not agree on like our facts but that was like wow. where she started this yeah. was at a car rental place wow. like yeah. we we're just having a friendly conversation and she's wow. like of course biden's a reptile and you know that but you know so you should just try you have to try and find common ground and say okay maybe an amphibian but i'm not going <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. i think people think? I, on, on the subject where people say you you know maybe you could find some common ground it's like no you can't we're multiplying by zero yeah, there's intelligence yeah. times zero is always going to be zero. There is no common ground with so, with so there's there's two elephants in the room, right? Here's one, and Brian, we've talked about this before, and I, I I can't remember who I heard talking about this first. But the army, you can't use an IQ test when you are screening for people to work at your company. I think it's been ruled illegal, but the army can, the military can, and they don't call it an IQ test. It's like a military aptitude something test. And what they determined was Wonder they Lake. had a That's point. I, I, what's it called? No, the Wonder Lake is NFL. I was making a bad joke. Yeah. All right. So anyway, long story short, uh, they have a cutoff point, which might be relative to like 84 on an IQ test. And it was released that 10 percent of the people who apply don't pass that. So 84 is like at that point, they think you, we can't be sure you won't stick the gun in your mouth while you're cleaning it or that you can be you know, comfortable making sandwiches in the Air Force or something. So they so if you just took that figure and said 10 percent is of the people who applied and, if, and we can just debate whether or not this is true but if you apply that to america how many people in america now 300 and 30 million, million. 30, oh, okay. so that makes 33 million adults walking around america 
who have an IQ too low to make sandwiches or be able to clean their own gun or learn how to make their bed. Now that doesn't count drug addicts, alcoholics, mentally ill people. So you're probably getting up to 50 or 60 million. So that's elephant in the room. Number one, these people are not capable to understand certain things or they're smart, but they're alcoholics or they got psychosis of some sort. And that's the first elephant. And the other elephant we've talked about before, I'll be very simple. Everybody in this room knows when there were centralized news agencies and everybody there went to major universities and studied journalism and worked at small town newspapers, went to bigger newspapers like the Chronicle or the Cleveland Plains the Dealer. Woodward's or whatever. and Bernstein's. Pardon? The Woodward's and the Bernstein's yeah. types. And, yeah. and they sit in the room in the morning and the Walter Cronkite, whoever sits at the end of the table, or Dan Rather, whoever it might have been, and then 12 people sit around and they bring stories and they say, this is an important story, important to the American people. Is there, are there two sides? Is there a pro and a con? Can you show both sides? What do Sorosin. we think? Pardon? Sorosin. Yes. Yeah. Now that doesn't exist because it's it's like in football, anybody follows football, you never went on fourth down, especially in your territory, but yeah, now there's right. computers and data and they've learned the, the analytics, as they say, if, you, if it's less than one yard and you've made two conversions already of less than three yards, is a 70% chance you're going to make that. Go for it. And so you never would have done that in my day. You'd have punted from their 35-yard line. So now in media, the numbers have shown, the data has shown that it's better to pitch red meat to the fringe. Yeah. No, very few people want to sit in the middle and read AP or Reuters or whatever else. They want something that looks like entertainment, not news, and they want it to reinforce their exact point of view. Mm -hmm. And once that starts happening, you know, it's like, what was it? The allegory of the caves from your Greek, you know, philosophy class. What, what is the shadow and what is reality? And so you got a lot of people that aren't terribly bright. A lot of people who are gathering news that only tells them what they, you know, I'm sort of hiding their warts and flaws, ag exaggerating the other warts. And this happens on both sides. If you look at chart, so if you see no, my hand, no, it doesn't. No, it yeah, doesn't. it does. But look at every be, chart. Look at every point. chart from every university in the United States and every group that knows media. And this far out is how far you're left and right, and this far up is accuracy. Come on, and man, you look here, there is not any any news organization, as far as I'm aware of, in the United States that that is the equivalent of Fox News. There just isn't. And, and here is what I don't understand: they went to trial. I, I, when they were when they Dominion. Dominion voting voting machines and they admitted that they lied. They admitted they lied. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, the owner of the network, admits that he lied. They admit that their host lied to the public. And yet and they paid hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties for the fact that they lied to their viewers. Yet their viewership is up today. So, I mean, it, 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 please explain that to me. Um, but, but, but here's the deal. You don't have to lie to lie. See, you lie by omission. You yeah. lie by the words yeah. you use in your speech. So if you, once again, when we get off the air, everybody go look. Here is whether you're left or right on charts, and here is how accurate and how, you know. And if you look up here, there's a handful of, and then it just starts going like this. And if you look at MSNBC in almost every poll, it's about here and about here with Fox. If I, if you said to me, if your wife says to you, what did you do last night? You came home late. And I said, oh, I played basketball with Brian. And then we had some beers. We did. That's not a lot. Oh yeah. And my secretary popped back in the office and we had sex on the desk. You know, you didn't tell me to tell you say everything. We had beers and played basketball. <laughs> what what I, part of that statement was untrue? I, and I had secret. I had sex, and I didn't invite you. And there were loose women up in the office. Poor Brian. I think. But I'm just saying. Oh, I, and we could argue if this is a little more, a little less, or this is a little further. But there are people on both yeah. sides gathering information. There is and they a danger. Think, this is the thing. They don't think. They don't think their feces smells, and it does. Yes. Look at. Oh, here's another. Ask people. There's a poll that asked uh, people, and it's on Skeptic. I don't know if you read Skeptic magazine. I follow their website and their Facebook page. It's Michael Shermer. It's a bunch of people who debunk nonsense, and they asked people on the left certain questions, and the answers were far off the mark. And they ask them yeah, where they I, get their news, MSNBC, uh, Democracy Now, um, you know, whatever else. And their you answers be trapped in the mark. Yeah, and I will tell you, the MSNBC in... does, the MSNBC obviously slants left. Because, yeah. And they slant left because they they report accurately, but the focus is on the misdeeds of the Republicans, not the misdeeds of the Democrats. They right. do report accurately, but the focus in the microscope is on the other side. It's not in their own house. So I will it's give just, that. It's as simple it's as this. It's the equivalent of Fox News. There's nothing yeah. 
That's the equivalent of Fox News. But but, but you're pre you're presenting you know. But you're presenting what I would call sort of a logical fail. It, they don't have to have the exact same number of lies or the exact. They just have to be here rather than here. It doesn't matter if Fox is here and MSNBC is here. This is where they should be. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't really. We can't. Okay. You know. I guess we could quantify how deceptive they all are. Uh, and one certainly is certainly more than the other. But still, if you're getting news from, if you can ask people 10 questions about race, about guns, about whatever, and people are completely off the mark and you ask them, where do you get your news? And they tell you that's quantifiable data. If you think uh, an AK, an, a an AR-15 is a fully automatic weapon. It's not. And you get your news primarily from one news source. That news source has to be somewhat responsible for pretending. If you think AR-15 is the number is the gun that kills most people in America, which it is not. First of all, mass shootings are the smallest way people die in America. Suicide number one, homicide number two. Mass shootings is over here, and in mass shootings, it's nine millimeter semi-automatic handguns. And you get over here, and it's AR-15. Right? And if you use AR-15, it's this big AR-15 style rifles. And so right. when you ask people from left-wing sources, they think that everyone is dying in America from AR-15s and they're fully automatic machine guns. And then where do you get your news? And they tell yes. you, that's how you quantify these things. So I don't have data in front of me to say they're exactly the same as right-wing radio or whatever, but there is a miss because they're not here to give you the news. They're here to feed you red meat so you keep coming back so they make more money. Now, yeah. let's, let's, let's not call it red meat. Let's call it what it is, disinformation and propaganda. Sure. The Armalite 15 shoots a Remington 223 round, which in school shootings appears to be amongst the group of semi-automatic weapons, the gun of choice because of its lightweightness and its uh, cheapness. But there are, Johnny correctly points out, other weapons that do the similar thing that wouldn't be banned if you just wanted to ban an Armalite 15. Eugene Stoner was the creator of that weapon in 1957, I believe. And at that time, he said he he believes that that weapon only should have been used, only should have been used for a uh, military purpose. There are soldiers, too, that, however, that say, listen, I fired an M4 and I fired this gun. Yeah, one's semi-automatic and one's not, but they're still both super dangerous. And as a soldier, we fired those weapons on the range. We were never allowed to take them back to the garrison. And that's something that people don't want to hear too. But yes, you are right. You can, but but a thirty odd six will blow a bear's head off from two hundred yards away, and a and, a and a and a dirty hairy gun will blow a hole in your engine block, you know, or a hole yeah, this yeah, big. It will. So you know, but yeah, million, but a yeah. but a Remington two twenty three round will do some serious damage. And there's been physicians that show videos. It it really just tears through sure. flesh. And but I'm saying there are other very there are other guns. But it's basically that it's the Maserati, or you might even say the Tesla of guns. It's lightweight, it's efficient, it doesn't have kick back. It, and here's another thing the left doesn't really understand, because the left lives more in urban areas than the right does. These people grew up with guns. They live out in rural areas. They live on farms. They live, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's that AR-15 is, I think, the number one gun in a uh, target shooting contest because it doesn't have kickback. And yes, yeah, and people don't really realize it's a small bullet. But people don't know anything. And I talk to people at parties who are outraged. I said, "What? What is the what is the muzzle velocity of that gun? Is it eight hundred feet per second? Eighteen? They have, no, they don't know anything about anything. But they read some story in the news or they saw some clip, and they're outraged. Yes, I, I'm not saying it should or shouldn't be banned. I'm just saying people don't are on the left who are gathering news from the left sure. don't really know what that gun is, how it operates, how it's different from a military weapon. Are there other guns that? have as much pack as much punch that aren't as popular and the answer is yes to all of some of those questions you mentioned, you mentioned the point. You it's not to endorse that gun or not you, but you, you, you talked about suicides for for a minute and i read a statistic that it's like wow and that is that you know suicide is a major cause of death and yep. i think the leading cause of death of it's white guns. men in america is, is is suicide and your odds of committing suicide in a red state are far greater they committing suicide in the blue state. And the reason being is because you've got you've got white men with access to handguns. Yes. Easier uh, access to handguns. And that's the weapon of choice. It's handguns that they're killing themselves. There's a great site for all of us to read. It's called Armed Armed with Reason. And it's it, it argues all the uh, John L. Lott, who is the economist, who is the NRA's uh, stat guy. And it, it really debunks a lot of stuff. S guns uh, by suicide. Guns by suicide outweigh cumulatively all other means of suicide by three to one. So 
it's mm. yes, it's far more dangerous yeah. to have a gun in your house than it men. is a knife it's or pills. By men, far, men, the gun is going to be the the the, the method of choice. Men, and to men. offer some levity here, uh, I'll tell you a joke that got cut from a Showtime show years ago in LA that was called Full Frontal Comedy and it was supposed to be edgy. And the joke I did was based on Carlos's saying, it was like, I wouldn't have a gun in the house ever just because um, it, you know, you're know, you more likely to have someone commit suicide. You're as likely to shoot your daughter coming home from college a week early or something like that. Uh, I, I just, if I would have an electronic stun gun, if you don't know how these, this is 20 years ago. If you don't know how that works, it uses electricity to render someone unconscious, not unlike a Bob Hope special. And so what you did, <laughs> cut, it got cut from Showtime's, uh, yeah. Hey, I'll tell you, I, I love that joke. I don't see why they cut it. That, that little Mexican guy, Lopez, had a great joke there. I'll tell you what. Yeah, I'll tell you, that kid's all right. Yeah, that joke got cut in like 1992 <laughs> from Showtime's Full Frontal Comedy. Cut. I'm like a Bob Hope special. Yeah, yeah. Well, come. Bob Hope is an icon here. You flew in. We flew you into the Bob Hope airport. You can't make... He, he performed for the troops. I'm not making fun of the troops. I'm just saying, That's as a 28-year-old guy, that show isn't exciting to me. No, use another... No, I'm sorry. Well, it was like, well, he did it until he was in his 90s, you know, and then finally they dropped his contract after 60 years when he... The, I remember his last special, Margaret Cho was on it, who did, she did a joke that I wrote uh, and, on that show. And mm -hmm. uh, and he was actually for the first time you saw him reading the cue cards. You actually saw him doing this mm -hmm. and reading the cue cards, and his time and he, his timing was off, and it was his time to go. Yeah. And I, I always think of Stephen Pearl's joke, which was you know because what what but he, he always put uh, whatever sponsor he had was was what he called his middle name. Like on radio, it was Pepsi. So he'd say, "Hi, this is Bob Pepsi and Hope talking." And Stephen Pearl's joke was, hey, this is Bob, why don't I shut up and die of hope? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wasn't there some comic that did it that he couldn't remember the lyrics? I forget. It might have been Leland Cotton Brown. I can't yes. be sure remember him. Uh, Elvis Presley, when he got older. Uh, trying to remember the lyrics late in his she career. She don't like rock and women. She don't like rock and roll. My baby's so sweet. Yeah, oh my, what was it all? <laughs> yeah, that was Leland Cotton Brown, the best yeah. Gene Wilder in the business, and to whom I owe my Gene Wilder impression when people say that it's good. But uh, let's see the Gene Wilder impression. Yeah, yeah you do a, do a great, a great yeah, Gene you are not evil, you are good. There you go. <laughs> I just watched um, back to back um, Blazing Saddles. And because I read Mel Brooks' book, which is great, and I highly recommend it. If you've not read, actually, don't read it. Get the audio book. He reads it himself, and listen, listen to him read it. Yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a a, a great uh, twelve hours. You know, okay. put it in the car and listen and, and listen. So back to back, I watched Blazing Saddles and I watched Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein totally holds up. Blazing yeah. Saddles. No, when I was no, a kid, no. I thought that farting scene was the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my uh -huh. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, but it just it just doesn't hold up. Some stuff doesn't hold up. Let me ask you this question because we're talking about references. So a while back, I thought I'm going to pull some of my old bits out. Will Durst had decided pull some of your bits out. You have old bits. You do them. You grow tired. Maybe your circumstance changes. You throw them away. Durst was like, those are great bits. Pull them back out. Dust them off. Create new on ramps. You know for them and do them. And I started doing them. And I updated the preferences. I'm excuse me, the references. And I started having kids, 25, 27 year old kids come up to me after shows going, man, you're the funniest guy we've ever seen, blah, blah, blah. So here's a question. There, there's a guy that on video who, uh, on YouTube that does that Jay walking thing. He goes even to campuses and asks kids questions. And now it's selective editing. We all know that. But there are people on campus at UCLA and he's asking them, what is the capital of the United States? What ocean lines the entire Eastern seaboard in the United States? Mm -hmm. Name two countries that border the United States and occasionally trick questions like how many gallons in a quart of milk, you know, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And they can't get, so are you guys worried that, I mean, that anybody, and we're all of a certain age more or less. Right. And so that, that your, your comedy with any references that we've just used in the last five minutes, most people under 40 don't know them. And that's probably two thirds, three quarters of the people that go to clubs. What do you, do you have any concerns about that? Are you altering your act no. at all? 
I think it, it depends on the reference. I mean, like you talk about that jaywalking thing and the questions that the kids couldn't answer. It's always been like that. On You Bet Your Life with, you know, uh, dating myself because I love old TV. Mm -hmm. um, on You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx, if the if the, the contestants didn't answer the quiz questions correctly, he'd give them a bonus question at the end. And the bonus question was, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Oh, yeah. yeah. Half of them would get it wrong. <laughs> Half of them uh, uh, Foster, <laughs> and this is not a clinical study, but I have done jokes for years, and they worked really well. And then all of a sudden, they stopped working. And one was I do jokes about beating myself up playing sports in school, football mainly. And I said things sure change. When I was in high school, all I wanted to do was play at Stanford. Now all I want to do is not walk like Fred Sanford. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I'm coming to join you, Elizabeth. Uh, it killed it. it killed for 30 years it gets nothing now and any and anybody under 30 and the oh, other yeah. one and there was another one about kennedy's um and they should have listened to me they were great at politics but very bad at transportation decisions had john uh taken the con the hard top and ted took the convertible they'd have saved a lot of aggregation aggravation you know yeah it's awesome and it got last yes. year kane even put it in his column when you know, not long before he passed away one of the best jokes he'd ever heard blah 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 I do that on stage now, unless I'm at a 55 and up community. Or yeah, forget it. it. Yeah, those reference those references are gone. We're in the well, here actually, and now, you can right? do you can do Kennedy assassination references, I think, and I'm going to test it because I thought there was a bit I was going through some stuff, and I it's, I'm I'm doing exactly what you said because I'm putting together a new set, and so I was going through some bits and some things that I used to do that for whatever reason I stopped doing them and updated them as I could, and the one joke that that, that I haven't I have not tried. And I wonder whether or not I can get away with it. And the joke is, is that I don't believe in conspiracy theories because you can't even keep a surprise party a secret. You know, you can't keep a surprise party secret without three days beforehand, somebody going up to the guest of honor going, uh, said, Bob, what size shirt do you wear? Medium, why? No reason. <laughs> yeah. We're supposed to believe that the mafia, the CIA, and Castro all got together to kill Kennedy and nobody blew it. Nobody walked up to him the week before and said, Miss President, when you go to Dallas next week, are you going to be riding around in a convertible? <laughs> yeah, why? No reason. Yeah. You now, like passenger side or driver side? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's one of the jokes I might get booed for. I remember, God, I remember this one night. You were there, Johnny. It was at Cobb. It was at Cobb's in the cannery. when we And it was during the time when we were having rolling blackouts in Northern California because there was an energy okay, issue. So we're, we're, we're blacking out certain cities in certain areas for periods of time. And and it was a, it was like a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night when it was professional. Uh, it was headliner workout night. And there was this couple um, from Texas that was sitting in the front row and just heckling everybody. Just the guy's got the cowboy hat, the whole thing. And they're older. They're like, you know, the seventies maybe. And they're, they're, you know, they're just heckling everybody. And so I get out and I can't remember what I said first. And the guy yells out, well, at least in Texas, we got electricity. And I said, well, at least in California, the president can ride around in a convertible without getting his head blown off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they shut up for the rest of the night. Yeah. <laughs> I'd get booed. If I did that joke today, I would oh, probably yeah. get booed, even though it's been 60 years. Yeah. Too soon? Yeah. Too soon. No, we're not, Brian, I think you're right to a certain extent. I think so. You, We all know this, right? The setup or premise to a punchline is as important as the punchline. Yeah. Give too much information, they see it coming, or you they lose a, a, yeah. a, a attention, you lose their attention. Don't give them enough. So I there's a for those who are not in the area, there's a bridge, there's a tunnel in the East Bay called a uh, Caldecott Tunnel, and it goes to a place called Contra Costa County. And so if I say I grew up, if I'm performing in San Francisco and I say I grew up. Uh, on the other side of the Contra Christian, uh, uh, the Culture Stop Tunnel in Contra Christian County, um, I get decent laughs from people who know what I'm talking about. But right. tourists from out of town just stare at me. Right. And if I say I grew up in Contra Costa County, point to it, on the other side of the Caldecott Tunnel, as I like to call it, Contra Christian County, on the other side of the Culture Stop Tunnel, I get more people on board. I hate doing that because I like to see them get it. But there are ways to 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 put more, you know, yeah, more but, breadcrumbs out to get more audience members to come to your punchline, you know. So I agree. I do that with Kennedy. I would do it with the assassination. Boy, the Kennedys had a lot of trouble. John Kennedy shot in Dallas. You know, Ted Kennedy right before his presidential bid. You know, drove his car into a creek and uh, over in uh, Chappaquiddick. And 
then I do the joke. I yeah, hate to do that, but if I do I'm that, gonna more people. Well, come I was on talking board. to somebody yesterday about the Pinkerton agency. I was a Pinkerton detective when I was in college for three months I, in, the, in the San Francisco offices, which, which was pretty cool. You're and a goon, Pinkerton goon, they called them you know, back in the, the day. The Pinkertons were formed in in the 1860s, and their main job was to protect Lincoln. And I was saying, you you had one job. <laughs> you had one job. Yeah. Keep the president from getting had shot in the head at the theater. One yeah. job. Yeah. And, and, and yet, for some reason, they're still around 160 something years That's later. Yeah. They're still in business after blowing yeah. that one job. <laughs> uh, we're, 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 we're out of time, so let's let's throw some plugs out. Johnny, where are you? I'm all over the place. Just go to my Facebook page. I got wineries, I got nightclubs, I got fish bait shops at johnnysteel.com or just find me on um on, on YouTube and very and Facebook and very soon uh I had the kids at a gig they came up to me after and they said dude you're funny and we were going to tell all our friends about you and we went to TikTok no Johnny Steel we went to Instagram no Johnny what is wrong with you they yelled at me yeah. so, <laughs> totally so and they told me how to do it you got like five minute reels what are you 90 30 second snippets, 18 to 30. So, so Sue, I'm in the process of totally revamping and reworking my social the media. Dog trick will get you viral, man. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nick, the dog Nick, trick. trick will get you viral. You should yeah. do that. There you go. There's your TikTok right there. I'll just save money on my uh, taxes. Come on, Nick. <laughs> Let's do it one more time. Let's say it once one more time. All right. We got to think of something else. Uh, what do you think? You want you want to go for a hike this afternoon, or you want to go to a bathhouse with pa uh, Paco? And, oh, we just, I, I can't even get to it. You I think he said my him. name. He doesn't want to go to a bathhouse. He doesn't want to go to a bathhouse with me. I, I, uh, I he, yeah. he jumped the gun on that. Yeah. Carlos, where are you going? Where, where, um, where you know what? I'm, I'm always on, I'm on Instagram and TikTok. I'm hip. Um, I'll be at the Midwest Toy Con in Bloomington, Illinois this weekend, and then at uh, ToonCon. Uh, October 8th in Burbank, California. So that's what I'm doing mostly these days is conventions and everyone's in a blue moon uh, stand up, but that's where I'll be coming up. You know, no, I've been going to, I've been going to, and actually I started producing comic book conventions when I was like in, in high school and stuff. And it blows my mind that there are, there's such a following for, for the voice artists now. Yeah, that they're you know, so you, you have long lines of people who are standing up to get stuff signed from, from, uh, Rocko's from Rocko's Modern, Modern Life from Fairly Odd Parents, and surprisingly, a video game on PS One called uh, Spyro the Dragon. I was the original Spyro the Dragon. Watch out for Nasty Nork! It's twenty five uh, year uh, anniversary, uh, and people go nuts for it. So that's awesome. Yeah. How about Take you, it. Paco? Uh, I'm I'm headlining the Punch Line October tenth, and oh. um, yeah, I'll be there back again at the Punch in San Francisco on October tenth. This Friday, I'm headlining a show in Campbell, uh, the Prudent Yard Cinema. So, but. I think it's sold out, but the punchline show, come to that if you can, October 10th. Is that still 444 battery at clay? It is still 444 battery at clay, yeah. It's still two oh, wow. drink minimum, 18 plus. Upstairs. Upstairs. What a club. What a club. Good for you. Yeah. What a club. Yeah. Well, that's how I knew I had made it in the Bay Area as a comic when I headlined the punchline the first time. Yeah. When you, There's no better feeling. Because I used to go, when I, I used to go to the punchline with a fake ID when I was in high school. You know, wow. said I was said I was 21 and I was Dr. Copeland. Oh, that's so funny. Uh, I'm a Pinkerton no, 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 detective. I'm Detective Copeland. Let me in. <laughs> you know, there's Copeland. still an audience for us. I do a thing once in a while with Michael Mean and Larry Brown, old school comedy blowout. And last time we were there, we're back there in January, but the punchline that is. But we were there a while back, and yeah, they comped a few tickets, but we filled yeah. the room on a on a Wednesday night, and the people were totally awesome. into it. There were a few younger people who were going along for the ride, but it was totally people who knew us all yeah. from the '90s uh, and comedy and the golden uh, days, man. I moved in '87, and I saw you guys perform, and I was just so influenced by everybody that I saw that was affiliated with uh, Alex Bennett. It was just. Yeah. A kid from Concord going to Sacramento State and then coming to San Francisco and going, wow, these guys are brilliant. So, right. you know, right. you know what the kids the call the 1990s? And, Pardon me? I'm not making this up. You know what the kids call the 1990s? No. The late 20th century. Uh, <laughs> the hey, there are kids, there are kids in the room, Brian, you know, there are kids in the room now that were uh, not born when 911 happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, if, if you graduated from if you graduated from college, the college or high school this year, you weren't born. 9-11 was 22 years ago. So yeah. if you graduated from college this year, you were not born on 9-11. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That wow, just, wow, wow. It just boggles the mind. So yeah. Well, pleasure having you here, Johnny Steele, Carlos Alves, Rocky Paco Romain. Thanks, guys. Always Thanks so much. Let's do it again soon. Send us a link. I'll do that. And I want to thank you for listening and or watching over the course of the last, we did a long one today, about an hour and a half. Uh, if you, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, go to YouTube, subscribe so we get to a thousand so that we can do this live and we can take your comments uh, and your questions during the course of the show itself. If you were listening and you want to help us out, whatever platform you're using, iTunes, Amazon, uh, Spotify, go and give us a five-star review because that helps people to find the show. So I don't don't that. forget, Brian, uh, send your complaints to brian at <laughs> brianbrooklyn.com. If there's one joke that you didn't like to take yeah, us yeah. down, <laughs> you're done. one joke, the, and, yeah. and, and we won't do another show for 15 years, just one joke. I'll check you out next week. Till then, be kind to your neighbor. Who knows where you live. <laughs> <laughs>